I didn't even know I was going to do this, but I think I'll throw it out there. Uh, a lot of times when we sing, you don't see me stand up. Most of the reason is if you could see my legs, you would see the knee braces that are on them tonight so I could stand up in front of you. And I'm not complaining. I'm just thanking the Lord that he allows me to do that. And uh, two things I hope you have tonight are one of these yes, sir. and one of these. Because yes, I'm going to throw a ton of scripture at you tonight. And uh, basically, I hope you'll take notes and go back and check all of this out. Uh, my, as I worked on this, I'm, I'm ringing up here, guys. There we go. As I worked on this message, I entitled it The Good Shepherd and the Responsibilities, but really it probably ought to be entitled The Shepherd and the Sheep. Because we're going to deal with not only a shepherd, we're going to deal with a sheep quite a bit tonight. So if you've got your Bible, open it please and turn it to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. I'm going to read two verses to begin with. So John 10, and, and you guys know me. I'm old. I wasn't around when the King James Version was written, but I do like it and use it. So that's what you're getting tonight. Amen, Herb. Good deal. John chapter 10, verse 11. Jesus is speaking. And he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And then jump all the way down to verse 14. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and I am known of mine. Yeah, guys. You know, this is when we're talking about Jesus talking about the sheep. It is so, so very powerful. Turn over a few pages to the 21st chapter of John. And understand this as I go through this tonight. While we're talking about shepherds, we're also talking about under shepherds. And we're talking about the duties and responsibilities of all of us. And the first thing we need to remember and always keep in front of us is the sheep belong to the great shepherd who is Jesus Christ. Amen. We're just entrusted with each other's care and well-being. <coughs> excuse me. So John chapter 1, or John chapter 21, excuse me, beginning in verse 15, and you probably have heard this scripture numerous times. So Jesus is talking with the disciples, and so it says, So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, you know that I love you. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Then he saith him again the second time, son, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he saith to him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he had said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said to him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Now there's a lot of things you can delve into in these few verses. You can talk about the three denials of Peter and the three opportunities to make amends. You can talk about the words that are used for love. Interesting, because the Greek words that are used for love differ from the word we use. They're actually more than one word. And if you study this, you know Jesus kind of flips things around on Peter because he's really looking at Peter's heart. But I want to look tonight at the feeding. Notice in verse, verse 15, what's the first thing he says? Feed my lambs. Okay? And then the other two verses he goes on, he changes it to feed my sheep. That denotes that as followers, we come as lambs and we should begin to mature into sheep. We have to be growing. That's what the feeding is about. You see, the word feeding here applies habitual and continual feeding, which causes growth. So there's a change here. Jesus goes from feed my lambs to feed my sheep. Guys, 
Do you know sometimes as we feed on God's word, it's very challenging? Yes. Amen. Yes. It should be. The point is here, we have to move from, from food that's acceptable from a lamb to food that's acceptable for a sheep. Hebrews chapter 5. And I'm not going to turn to all these tonight because it would take forever. But there's a couple of them I really want to read to you. Hebrews chapter 5. And I'm going to be looking at verse 12. For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, not of strong meat. Wow. Do you realize that's an indictment? It's an indictment for us. We're willing to accept the milk, but we're not so much willing to go to the strong meat. Solid food. Some of the, some of the uh, translations say solid food. So what's solid food? When I tell you solid food, what do you think that is? According to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 through 12, solid fruit is, fruit is training in righteousness so the flock can be fully equipped to serve the Lord. Training in righteousness is not always easy. You realize that? Yes. Some things we have to throw out from the Word that are difficult. And I tell Moses all the time when we're studying and talking about things that we'll come to a certain passage that may be difficult, and I'll go, you know, he could have left that out. It wouldn't have bothered me if he'd have left that out. I could have dealt with it. But he puts it in, and he puts it in for a reason. And he puts it in that we could be fully trained for the righteousness we need to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's difficult to feed the flock. But you know what? It's incumbent that every one of us are studying the Word and knowing the Word so we're able to feed the lambs. You see, when we come to the, to the lambs, practically everybody that I know in this room should be well equipped to feed the milk. You may have to study some to be there to feed the solid food. But we need to be ready, ready and willing to feed the milk to the lambs. First point, the shepherd has to be involved in the feeding of the flock. Okay, and I've just given you a whole outline about that. Second point, we have to water the flock. I'm not going to turn there, but you can check this out in Genesis 29, verses 2 and 3. The story is told of the shepherds coming to a well. And they come to this well, and there are three flocks of sheep waiting to be watered. And to get to the water, the shepherds have to roll a great stone away from the well. And after the sheep had come and watered, the stone was placed back over the well. So you see, the shepherd had to be bringing the availability of the water. Now, in the Bible, water many times alludes to the Holy Spirit. And so, picture this. There are times when the shepherd or the under-shepherd has to roll away the stone of a hard heart. And that can only be accomplished by preparing the hearts to receptive of the leading of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit takes over, the stone of self leaves, Amen. and He takes over and begins to, to work with us diligently in our spirit, in our minds, in everything that we do. Let me tell you something. If the stone of self has been rolled away, you will be a prayer warrior. Mm -hmm. Everybody's going, mm -hmm, yeah, okay. Monday night, this room 
is open to prayer warriors, should be filled with prayer warriors. You realize how much power there's generated in the power of prayer? You know, that's the privilege of coming. And I realize you can pray anywhere. You can pray at home. You can pray on the road. You can, anywhere you are. But there's something about when God's people come together corporately and are just addressing the needs, the desires, and everything that the church is going through, lifting it to the Father in prayer. I encourage you to be here on Monday night. I know it's one more night of the week. <laughs> Let me tell you, my, bless my, my honey's heart. I told her today, I'm so tired of going every day. It seems like we always have some place to go and something needs to be done. But you know what? Very honestly and very transparent with you, if I could only come to one service a week, I'd want it to be Monday night prayer time. I hope you come to more services a week, but I really encourage you to come to Monday night. You will walk out of here changed from the time you got here. I promise you that. So we have to water so the stone of self can be removed. And you know what? When that happens, a life of prayer and obedience to Christ takes over. Don't you want to be led by Christ? Don't you want Him to be the paramount, premier focus of your life? I do. I want to be there. I want to be that person who is feeding and watering the ones that are coming. You'll have to excuse me because I have to use notes anymore because God's allowed me to experience a couple of strokes and I don't remember like I used to. So we're going to use some notes as we go through tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Brady. <laughs> Feeding, watering. Sheep need to be sheared. Did you know that? <laughs> High maintenance. Deuteronomy 18, 4 through 5, chapter verses 4 and 5, talks about the shearing of the sheep. Now, shearing of the sheep is profitable. Do you know that? It's profitable to both the sheep and to the, uh, and to the shepherd. So there is necessity for shearing. I don't know about a sheep. I've never been a sheep other than the biblical term. But I don't know if it's very comfortable to be sheared or not. Uh, I'm sure it's different for them. When we're talking about shearing in the biblical perspective though, we're talking about discipline, encouragement, sometimes a rebuke. And all of that is intended to make a flock fit for service to the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 through 5. Preach the word in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves such teachers, having itching ears. Wow. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned to fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist. Make full the proof of thy ministry. Paul is talking to Timothy as he leads him towards a more profitable ministry. But understand this. Sometimes sheep, we have to be sheared. It's not a pleasant task for the shepherd, I don't believe. But it's a necessary task. It has to be done. Hebrews chapter 12. I told you I was going to throw a bunch of scripture at you. So, so it's coming. This this. Bear with me, I may have to get to a couple of them, but we're a long ways from done. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons, and what son is he whom the Father chastens not? 
But if you be without chastisement, wherefore all are partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers with our flesh that correct us and gave them reverence. We shall not much rather be in subjection to the Father of the spirits and live. You know what? Probably one of the worst things that a pastor has thrown at him is when he has to come to somebody in the flock and, I, and deal with a situation that he doesn't want to deal with. But he has to anyway. That's a part of shearing, guys. And you know what? We're going to talk a lot more here in a little bit about the under-shepherd and what the under-shepherds have to do. And if the under-shepherd is doing what he is supposed to do, that becomes a part of his responsibility. I'm going to challenge you. When one of the under-shepherds of the great shepherd has to come to you and say, Hey, I've seen this and I think we need to deal with it. Open your heart, open your mind, don't get defensive and say, Pastor, show me in the Bible what we're talking about and let me grow. Let me get from being a lamb to a sheep. Let me grow every day. Interesting. Isaiah 40:11 tells us that one of the duties of the shepherd is delivering the lambs. That's probably one of the better duties of the shepherd or the under-shepherd. You see, Jesus is the only one that can save. We preach the gospel, the Holy Spirit convicts, and then a person's heart and attitude changes, which is repentance, and then they come to know Jesus Christ. And when you come to know Jesus Christ, you become a sheep. You become a sheep of the flock. If you don't get any other points tonight, get this. You are one of three things. You're either a sheep, a wolf, or a goat. And we'll deal with that in a little bit. So, it is so fantastic when the word is shared and somebody comes to know Jesus Christ. You ever led anybody to the Lord personally? I hope you have. That is the highest high there ever has been in the world is leading somebody to Jesus Christ. To, to share with them the truth of the gospel and watch their eyes open and watch them go, you know, I believe what the Bible says. That's euphoric when that happens. It is so fantastic. You know, if you've never done that, Find somebody that you know needs the Lord and just share with him. Just share with them. Oh, yeah, you know what? How much scripture do you really have to know to share Jesus Christ with somebody? I'm going to do Moses' thing right now. That much. Because you know how you do it if you don't know a lot of scripture? You say, you share your story, amen. You say, this is me. I was living this way. I'm a sinner that was living this way. I came to a meeting with Jesus Christ. I realized the truth of who Jesus Christ is, that He is the Savior of all mankind, and I accepted what He did on that cross, and I believe that He was resurrected and is with the Father, and now my life has changed to this way. That's, the gospel. That's all the gospel you have to know, guys. You can do that without quoting a word of Scripture. Now let me challenge you. You need to have some Scripture to back up what you're saying. But that's really all it takes. That's really all it takes to deliver a lamb. Did you ever think about that? When you do that and lead somebody to the Lord, you're delivering a lamb? Wow. That's exciting. You know that? That's exciting to watch a lamb be delivered. Okay, so we've, we're feeding we're watering, we're shearing, and along with the shearing comes the grooming. Because see, we have to groom, we have to, keep, we have to keep the sheep free and clean from contamination. How's the contamination come? The world, the flesh, and the devil. We have to work on keeping the, the sheep clean in that situation. We do that through the shearing process, through the grooming process, through working with the sheep and leading them where they need to be. 
taking them from where they are and helping them know that there's a better way of doing things. Let me, let me help you get cleaned up. Let me help you get cleaned up. Have you ever come to the point when you feel absolutely free in Jesus Christ? Yeah. Amen. Because that's where we need to be. Share a personal word with you for a moment. I don't think most of you, some of you, a lot of you have seen, have heard my testimony before, but yeah, I'm going to do this. When I proposed to my Marty, it was kind of a weird proposal. You'd had to been there to have, yeah. It wasn't one of those romantic things like you see on TV, let me tell you. Someday maybe she'll share with you how that worked out. But I told her these three things. I said, I love you. I want to marry you. I love my mom and dad. And the rest of the world can go to, and I'm not going to tell you where I said the rest of the world could go to. Because that's the way I felt at the time. That was me. You know what? I didn't care if my neighbor lived or died. I certainly didn't care if he had a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then several Actually, it was years later, wasn't it? I had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And he took a man that did not like anybody, didn't love anybody for sure, didn't even like himself very much a lot of times, and turned me to a man that strives to love every human being. And I'm going to tell you what, that's not easy sometimes. But at some point, I got delivered, and I became a lamb of God, a part of the flock. That's what I pray for everybody. So we've delivered the lambs. Now we need to lead them. The scripture I'm going to give you for that is Psalm 23. Anybody ever heard that before? It's, it says that we're, the, the great shepherd leads us by the still waters. He leads us into the green fields. His rod and his staff, they comfort us. I looked for a staff this week. Y'all ever find, tried to find a staff in this day and age? You, you can't walk into a department store and say, where's your selection of staffs? They just look at you like, well, so-and-so is an accountant, so-and-so. No, that's not the staff I'm talking about. I, well, I didn't find a staff, but I think you know what I'm talking about. You know, the long rod with, with a hook on the end. The staff is actually a weapon of defense. It's also a weapon of offense. You see, the, the crook on the staff at the top of it could be used for two things. Hopefully what it got used for in our case is the sheep would be going away and the shepherd would reach out with the crook and gently put it over its neck and say, come on, back over here, back over here. You're going the wrong direction. I'm told that the staff actually could be used to break the neck of a wolf. That it could reach around there and if you twisted just right like the shepherd knew, it would protect. But definitely the other end, the, the end that was straight, could become a, an offensive weapon to uh, ward off the wolves that were coming after the sheep. You know, one of the things that And God's going to change this on me. One of the things that happened with sheep, because the few messages I've heard about sheep prior to this talked about how dumb sheep are. And there's some, probably a degree of truth in that. But you know what a sheep's method of protection is when a predator comes upon it? The flock will draw closely together. They will pack in tight because then they present a more formidable body. And when the, when the predator was coming, the flock would draw close together. It's a whole lot harder to attack the flock than it is to an individual. Guys, the unity of the Holy Spirit brings us together as a tightly packed flock. 
It has to bring us together as a tightly packed flock. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Paul talks to the church at Ephesus a lot about this. Chapter 4, verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The unity of the Spirit brings the bond of peace. Did you hear that? Yeah. The unity of the Spirit brings the bond of peace. And then he goes on in 12 and 14 of that same uh, chapter, chapter 4. Why did, what happens when, the spirit, when we're unified in spirit? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all, key word there's that one little word, all, come in the unity of faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, and by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. How do we keep from being deceived as a flock? We stay unified in the Spirit. We bond together. We become a formidable adversary when we bond together. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. Did you know that? There are absolutely no Lone Ranger Christians. Well, that leads me into the next point. Do you know there are sheep that will wander? Absolutely. Really? You already knew that? Man, here I think I'm going to give you something new and fresh, and you already know all this. Jesus gave the parable in Luke 15. It starts in verse 4 about how many having a hundred sheep, one of them begins to wander and stray. He'll leave the 99 and go after that one which is wandering. Guys, as shepherds, we have to restore the wandering sheep. We have to bring them back where they, from where they come. And isn't it interesting that the Bible is very clear that many people have and will continue to wander away from the flock. Hmm? Yeah. Amen. What was that Moses told me one time? Somebody told him we, pick, we preach to the parade. People come, people go. For every reason under the sun. And all God's wanting us to do is unify by His Holy Spirit and be a flock that bonds together. Amen. He even gave us he even gave us a, uh, a parable here about what we need to do when sheep wander. We need to try to restore them. We need to work, and we need to try to search for the ones that's wandering and bring them back in love and concern and joy. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25. I told you I was going to throw a lot of scripture at you. <laughs> For ye were sheep, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. So sheep are unruly. They're willing to wander off and be on their own. And if you think about what I've talked about in this sermon, when they wander off and are on their own, they are much more vulnerable to attack and to doing everything that they don't need to do. See, a wandering sheep will get in trouble. A sheep that's in the flock will stay together. And the predator can't get to them. Protection, that's my next point. Now, true protection only comes from the, from the, the really great shepherd who is Jesus Christ. Don't ever, don't ever get the idea that we are placing ourselves above Jesus. 
He's it. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the great shepherd. Some of us, actually all of us, if we will go there and we will begin to study, lead us to be under shepherds. There's somebody that you need to be shepherding today. I don't care. Unless you got saved this morning before you came to church, you know enough to there's somebody you need to be shepherding today. Why is that? Well, Paul meets with the leaders at Ephesus, and he tells us this in Acts chapter 20, verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Remember earlier I said you're either a sheep, a goat, or a wolf? Interesting about the wolves, guys. Matthew 7, 15 equates the wolves to false teachers. The wolves try to make themselves look like sheep. What do you do when you counterfeit something? Absolutely, you copy it, but you try to make it look as much like the genuine article as is possible. When the wolves begin to infiltrate the flock, mm, that's a a tough time, guys. You see, I kind of liken the church to the sheepfold. And I don't know if you know much about the way the sheep were taken care of in biblical times. And the reason Jesus used this this illustration of the sheep is because the, con- the people of th- that time, that, that society, they were agricultural people, they were farmers, they, they knew everything about what he was talking about. They knew how sheep had to be t- traded, they knew how they had to be tended, they knew everything about them. And so they built sheep folds, which is basically just an enclosure. And they built both permanent and temporary sheep folds. And the permanent sheep fold was just that, more permanent. It had a place for the sheep to come in with a pretty solid fence around it. It had a, a uh, place where they could feed and a place where they could sleep. And they were well protected in the permanent sheepfold. But sometimes it was necessary for them to go into other parts of the country. So the shepherd would build a temporary sheepfold. And what he would do is he would take stones, and rocks, and sticks, and vines, and whatever he could find, and he would build an enclosure, pretty much like a circular enclosure. And in that enclosure, he would leave an opening, which was like a gate. And when he wanted the sheep in and protected, he would bring them through that enclosure. And at night, after he had them all in, you got a completely secure area, except for one place, right? Right? where the sheep entered. You know what the shepherd did then? He became the gate. He would lay in that gap so the sheep could not get out and the predators couldn't get in. That's given your life for the sheep. He would sleep there all night to make sure that his sheep were taken care of. Another interesting thing about the sheep gate is, go all the way back with me to the 10th chapter of John, okay? And Jesus speaking here. Very, verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth in some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that enter in by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter, or watchman in a lot of uh, versions, open and the sheep hear his voice, and he call the sheep, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he put forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee for him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Now I'm told in biblical times the shepherd actually named a sheep. He would pick out a name for every 
sheep that was in the flock, usually because of some characteristic that they had, something they did that was particularly unique to that sheep. And when he put them in that sheepfold, be the permanent or the temporary, they would stay there. Especially when it got light and they weren't afraid and they knew where they were and everything was going on. And the shepherd would come up and he would call his sheep. Come on, whatever, you, whatever name you want to use for a sheep. Come out, come out, come out, come out. And the sheep were so in tune to the shepherd, they recognized his voice. And to his voice alone would they obey. So when the shepherd said, you come out, that sheep that was part of his flock would come out. And if there was a sheep in there that was not part of his flock, it would stay. So when the good shepherd calls us and say, come out, it's time to come out. It's time to do what he says, okay? It also says, and like I, like I said, I, in verse 3 it said to him, the porter, or the watchman, is called to be a, a, a watchman over the flock. Check out Ezekiel, chapter 33, verse 6 and 7. I don't know that I'm going to turn there, but it talks about Ezekiel being set over as a watchman over the nation. And it says that his responsibility was to warn those inhabitants of impending danger. And it says if he warns them and they don't listen, it's on their, it's on their head. But if he doesn't warn them and they get attacked, their blood was on his head. Guys, if messages coming from this pulpit don't warn us all about impending dangers, the blood is on the head of the person who is bringing it out. So it's important to us to be in God's Word and absolutely every chance we get share what God's Word says, what leads us to the unity of the Holy Spirit and helps us to grow more towards the righteousness Christ would have us to be. Well, that was a great place for an amen, and y'all just missed that completely. Just blew right by you, didn't it? But of necessity, we must share the entire teachings of this word. And the entire teachings of this word, as I've already said, can be very hard to accept. Because, you know, interestingly, Jesus didn't pull any punches when he was in doing, when he was doing ministry. Do you realize that he called the religious leaders of the day, the hierarchy of those that led in worship, whitewashed tombs, a brood of vipers. Hmm. I wonder what he would have to say today to those that preach a social gospel and ignore many tenets of his word. If he was willing to say, say that to the Jewish leadership, I wonder what he would say today to those that aren't bringing truth from the pulpit. So, kind of do, I want to do a couple of things as I wind down here. I think Tom is going to come. Because we're going to conclude here in a minute. Understand this. We who are the body of Christ are called to be under shepherds in varying degrees. Not everybody's called to preach. Not everybody's called to pastor. Not everybody's called to teach. Although some of you are. Not everybody is called to man the coffee bar, although some of you are. But we're all called to be under shepherds to somebody. We need to take our responsibility seriously. A 
but your yes be yes and your no be no. If you have set forth a responsibility, do it. We need to feed the lambs and the sheep. We need to bring them to good pastures and good water. We need to clip them and groom them. We need to deliver new lambs. We need to be leading and teaching them to stay together and not wander off because in doing that, we protect the flock. So I'll go right back to that question tonight. You're either a sheep, a wolf, or a goat. You know who you are. Wolves and goats counterfeit. They're not the true followers of Jesus Christ. If you have never, before tonight, made a decision to be a sheep, and that kind of sounds funny, doesn't it? But to be a true follower of Jesus Christ, to say, you know what? I want to hear the Good Shepherd. I want to hear him call me by name when he wants me to come out of the sheepfold and do something. And I want him to be the Lord of my life. If you've never done that before tonight, don't leave here without doing that. Because you know what? God does not promise us another second. Every breath is a gift of God. Every day is a gift of God. John Wesley said it this way. You have nothing to do but be involved in saving souls. So let your life be spent in this effort. Whatever your decision is tonight, Pastor Moses is going to come in just a second as we finish up. I'd like to close in a word of prayer. I thank you all for being so attentive. I thank you for being here tonight. And I thank you for hearing this message. Father God, thank you. Thank you that you're the great shepherd. And thank you, Lord, that we have the ability to be obedient sheep if we will just listen to your voice. So, Lord, I ask now as we close this service that in obedience to your voice, we will do exactly what you tell each and every one of us to do. And, Lord, we thank you. We thank you and praise you for what you're doing in our lives today and for all of eternity. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Brother Moses. Brother Moses. Great message, Pastor. Um, So I was reminded over there as I was listening, here you are again at Revolution Church being called higher again. Called higher, called higher, called higher. God wants more for you. God wants more from you. And this closing quote from John Wesley, you know, again, like, give your life to the work of the ministry. Just great message. I don't know if I like the part about the sins being on my head if I don't share the truth. In its completion, but I know that it's very true, and the New Testament reaffirms it. That we're supposed to obey our spiritual leaders as uh, they've been given the charge to care for your soul as those who will give an account. And so, we don't take it lightly here, and so we do want to share the fullness of God's Word with you, because that's the task God has given us, and it's where human flourishing exists. So we want that for you. I want to thank uh, so many of you for the positive feedback that I've received from last weekend's message of unity in the body of Christ, reiterated again tonight, harmony in the body of Christ, all of us coming together in one voice, giving praise to God. All of us are different, that diversity is beautiful. And that's where people need to be in a place where they can see the fullness of who Jesus Christ is. And so that requires great sacrifice and it requires great commitment. And so as we get ready to receive our offering, actually, Mike, I'm going to ask if you and 
Uh, maybe Matt, could you grab a basket?